To another installment of the Explorers Club. This is all about the Antikythera mechanism and we will be talking to Greg Chivers who has done a lot of research into the history and mystery surrounding this unusual and unique device. The shipwreck containing the Antikythera mechanism was discovered off the coast of the island of Antikythera in 1901 and a year later the Greek archaeologist Valeris Stace identified this chunk of rusting metal as containing a cog and mechanical parts. The device absolutely baffled historians of the time, and investigations were more or less shelved until the 1950s. In 1951, the British science historian and Yale University professor Derek de Sola Price became interested in the mechanism. In 1971, Price and Greek nuclear physicist Harilampos Kalkulus made X-ray and gamma-ray images of the 82 fragments. Price concluded from the gear settings and inscriptions on the mechanism's faces that it was made in about 87 BC and lost only a few years later. A team led by Mike Edmonds and Tony Freeth at Cardiff University have since used modern computer X-ray tomography and high-resolution surface scanning to image inside fragments of the crust-encased mechanism and read the faintest inscriptions that once covered the outer casing of the machine. Detailed imaging of the mechanism suggests that it had 37 gear wheels enabling it to follow the movements of the moon and sun through the zodiac, to predict eclipses and even to model the irregular orbit of the moon. We have come a very long way in our understanding of the workings of the Antikythera mechanism, but mysteries remain about its invention and its seeming one-offness in the world. What does Greg Chivers think? To sort of point us in that, in that, in that direction, um, there are good reasons to think about other theories. So let's look at some of them. One of the best theories for, or at least one of the most interesting theories for who created um, the mechanism is, is this guy. Now you all, you all know these, this guy, um, Archimedes um, jumping out of bathtubs, uh, displacement theory. Um, and there are good reasons to think um, that he, he could be the creator. We know he was really interested in, in astronomy. We know he was a brilliant um, mathematician. Sorry, I'm just a drink of water. There are stories of him creating some really advanced technology in the ancient world. In, in some ways, he's the go-to guy for it. Um, I, I don't know how many of you would have heard the story of the, of the Archimedes um, ray gun. Um, I'll, I'll just cover it briefly if, for the, the, those who haven't. Um, he lived in the city of Syracuse on the east coast of Sicily, which is a Greek city. And when the Roman army attacked, um, he created mirrors to focus the sun's light and set fire to attacking Roman ships. Um, there's all sorts of stories about it. There's illustrations. But pe when people have tried to recreate um, the feet experimentally, we've had kind of mixed results. You'd need incredibly powerful sunlight. You'd need the Roman fleet to have made their sails out of paper. 
So we're not sure about that, but we do know that he was genuinely producing some interesting tech. The, the, the classic is the Archimedes screw seen in children's playgrounds or all, all over the country. Um, it's still used in, our, uh, in um, irrigation systems all over the world and in agriculture. I actually saw one in a noodle factory um, a couple of months ago uh, before, before lockdown. So um, uh, we know he's a bona fide um, inventor of technology that's still used today uh, and, and he probably had the brain to do it. Um, but there's a problem and the problem is this. Um, Archimedes is unlikely to have created the Antikythera mechanism um, because he died. Um, this painting is the death of Archimedes. Um, I don't know if it went exactly like this. Uh, according to the story, uh, the Romans had all been told, Roman soldiers had all been told to spare the life of the great scientist because he was valuable. Um, but when they reached him in his workshop, he was really busy with um, some geometry. Um, and apparently uh, he was a bit awkward, a bit difficult. And he said, do not disturb my circles. Um, and he pissed off the Roman soldiers uh, and they killed him. Um, and we know exactly when that happened. Archimedes died in 212 BC because that's when the city fell. And going back to our inscription um, on the wooden box, which contains um, the Antikythera mechanism, um, the inscription on the box is from an event in 204 BC. And again, it's just a bit unlikely that Archimedes would create the device um, and, and then die in 212 BC, and then somebody else in 204 BC would add the inscription later. So, um, yeah, the um, Archimedes theory doesn't quite pan out. It, it, I think it's a, a good effort, and it's still worth thinking about, you know, because there's a lot of problems here. And then we look at the map again. Um, so Archimedes is living in um, Syracuse, which is on the west side of this map. Um, it's the east side of Sicily, just underneath Catania. It's about 800 kilometers uh, from where the Antikythera mechanism is found. Um, and it's not that you can't travel 800 kilometers or 500 miles in the oil. You absolutely can. Um, but as it turns out, there are some very good reasons to think that the mechanism might have been created somewhere a little bit closer to where it sank. So we come back to the shipwreck where the Antikythera mechanism was found. Um, among the and, and the coins, uh, there was also pottery. And some of, or indeed most of the pottery the archaeologists found in the shipwreck was made in what they call the Rhodian style, um, which means uh, it comes from the island of Rhodes. And if we look at a different map now, um, Rhodes is still not super close to where, where the mechanism's found. Um, and indeed, if you follow Google's advice and you try and walk, you'll spend a very long time getting there. But um, it's, it's closer um, than Syracuse to the mechanism's location. And there are a few other good reasons why Rhodes could be the point of origin for the mechanism. But to a modern kind of audience, like Rhodes doesn't seem particularly likely because this is what it is today. Um, this is the resort of Falaraki. This is what most people go to Rhodes for. But, uh, I'm sure these gentlemen are having a wonderful time. In the ancient world, Rhodes is a very different place. It is an intellectual um, and scientific hub. Um, when the Emperor Tiberius wants the best education money can buy for his son, he sends his son to Rhodes to learn from the finest scholars, the, scholars, the finest um, rhetoricians. Uh, and so there, there's a massive center of brain power on Rhodes. And there are other reasons too why Rhodes could be a place where you'd make an ancient computer, specifically out of bronze. There's this big guy. Um, 
This is, I'm sure you've all seen this, this is the Colossus of Rhodes. Uh, he's an 80 foot high uh, statue of the god Helios, who's the patron deity of, of the people of Rhodes. Uh, and he's one of the wonders of the, of the ancient world. Uh, people came from all over the place to see him simply because nowhere else in the ancient world, certainly around the Mediterranean, could make something like this. Um, so we're seeing advanced metalworking skills on roads. Um, just as a little side note, in actual fact, he didn't straddle the harbour like that. Um, the real Colossus stood slightly to one side and looked down, so you wouldn't like sail underneath him and get an eyeful as you looked up. Um, but yeah, even after the Colossus fell, um, people still flocked to see the big bronze metal remains for 600 years before people started stealing them for scrap metal. So Rhodes has um, a great sort of intellectual centre and it also has great craftsmen making um, tricky objects out of metal. And they're doing other stuff. They're making other bits of advanced technology. I think um, the one in the picture on the left actually might be from Alexandria, which is Greek city at the time as well. But um, yeah, th we know uh, the Greeks at around this time are making these things. They're called or, um and they're basically uh, primitive steam engines. Um, the naked flame heats a metal vessel full of water, the water expands uh, into steam, and then the steam shoots out of the little spouts and drives the globe spinning around. So that's um, a very simple, not particularly useful steam engine. Um, now, the Greeks, for whatever reason, we're not sure of, the Greeks didn't really exploit this technology. As far as we know, um, they used the Eolopile primarily for making spooky noises, like whistles and hoots in temples. Um, seems like a bit of a missed opportunity, uh, but it's again, it's evidence that um, the Greeks around this time are um, making some pretty advanced tech. Uh, I did have a video of a uh, hydraulic burglar alarm as well, but somebody's take, taken that offline. So, um, But anyway, so we've got a few good pieces of evidence here um, about where the mechanism could come from. We've got possible point of origin. We've got a possible date of creation. Um, you'll notice I'm only talking in sort of the scope of possibilities here because that's about, you know, we're talking about something 2000 years old here. It's very hard to be definite. But um, with these two clues, they might point us in the direction of a possible creator for the mechanism. Um, there's this fellow. Um, he is uh, Hipparchus of Rhodes. Uh, he's known as Hipparchus of Rhodes. He was actually um, born in Nicaea and did a lot of his work in Alexandria. Um, you'll see there's an obelisk in the background of that picture. But um, he's part of the great, well, he's, he's almost the epicenter of um, the intellectual scene uh, in Rhodes. Hipparchus is a great astronomer. He's a great mathematician. Um, Hipparchus produces the first functional model of the movements of the sun and the moon. Um, so there's every reason to think that he could be at least the uh, intellectual um, sort of brain behind the thinking of the Antikythera mechanism, if not actually the, the guy who, who, who put it together. So we come back to um, you know, a, a, a cent, cent, central mystery, this ancient computer. We've got a picture of the place it could have come from, this wonderful um, intellectual hub in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean. We've got a possible creator. We've got a possible date um, so for its creation. So in some ways, with all of these sort of plausible theories, um, you could almost think um, that the mystery behind the mechanism's creation has been solved. And it would be fair to ask that question. How, has the mystery been solved? And at this point, I have to return to what 
the father of the mystery said, old Derek J. de Sola Price. And if we look at what he said here, we realize that the mystery has in no way been solved because everything that he said here is, is still true. And we still don't know why all these, these things, things are true. So um, even if we know who made it and kind of vaguely and where they made it and who with, um, we've still got the funda fundamental mystery that there's nothing like it elsewhere. And that's not how technology works um, in human experience, generally. Um, you know, there are, you, you look at the development of flight, um, there are, while the Wright brothers have the, um, get, the, get the record, there are parallel developments happening in Britain and France within weeks or months. Uh, and it's the same for every major, major invention. There is intense competition all, all over the world. And there are, if not, um, there's, there's competition, com competing devices. There are prototype devices. There are devices that have taken the technology from one, one machine and then developed it. And none of that happens for some reason with the Antikythera mechanism. It just exists in this weird, weird background. And the point about nobody writing about the mechanism. Some people have kind of argued this point more recently. That they've said, oh, well, you know, Cicero is, at around this time, Cicero is talking about um, uh, Archimedes building an orrery. Um, and an orrery is a wonderful thing, you know, it's a model of the planets moving around, a physical um, 3D model of the planets moving around. Um, but it's a hell of a lot different to a computer that will tell you what they'll do. Um, so uh, I, I still think the point is valid that, that nobody's writing about it. But there's another thing that Derek doesn't refer to here, which is that there's none of the boring evidence for the... Um, mechanism's existence or for other things like the mechanism existing. So normally when we have look at archaeological records, we look at tablets, inscriptions, that sort of thing, half of the most useful ones we find are bills and invoices and accounts and they're really boring but they tell us what's going on because people are invoicing for work on something or, or for supplying materials for something to be made or commissioning something to be built. And nobody's commissioning the Antikythera mechanism. Nobody's um, supplying materials for it. Nobody's supplying labor for it, or for anything like it, anywhere. So, um, and there is nothing of this sophistication um, in, the, in the world at this time. For whatever reason, um, the intensely clever clockwork technology on the back of it, um, nothing like that appears until the 13th century. Uh, and then even once that technology appears, nobody does anything with it substantially until the Renaissance. So really, while we have some answers to the mechanism, its fundamental mystery remains intact. So one day, um, one day we might have answers to, to some of those questions uh, until we do, we can make up stories. And so I made one. Um, and that's my plug for the book. Um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it uh, uh, um, from me. Uh, there are other things to explore about the mechanism, but I think those are some of the most interesting ideas about it. And if you've got any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them. That was great. Thank you, Greg. It's really interesting. Oh, am I... Um frozen again uh no no i can hear you now okay i'll unmute everyone and then can you hear me okay yep that was cool that was really interesting oh good so greg how i do wonder how it is that the Antikythera has been called a computer because it's not a computer in the way that we recognize computers these days. It seems like a mechanical device. So what differentiates it from something like an orrery or a uh, astrolab or something like that? 
Yeah, um, and that, that is a point that people raise, and I, I think it's a point worth talking about. Um, but the critical thing about the Antikythera mechanism that makes the computer is that um, you can ask it a question and it will come up with an answer. Um, you know, a, a, something like a clock or, or, or an or, or orrery, um, they are not interactive. Um, they, they are there to, they are, they're illustrative. You know, um, a clock will tell you what the time is. Uh, an orrery will show you um, the pattern of movement of astral bodies. But um, you can ask the mechanism a specific question. What will Saturn be doing um, in four months time? Uh, and then you twiddle the cogs on the back and it comes, it calculates an answer. Um, so that is the act of computation. Um, and actually, if you look at um, what we think of as, as the first modern computers, like sort of, you know, uh, Colossus, uh, as the, the British computers that were developed for the Enigma program, um, they're, they're specialist computing devices in the same way. They're being asked very specific questions. Um, they're being asked to run through possibilities of what different letters could mean in translating them from code. So really, um, the Antikythera mechanism is, is while much simpler and, and, and more mechanical, it's doing a very similar job to them. Uh, and so it's, it, it really is a significant step on, on the road to computing. Okay, that's, that's great. Does anyone else have any other questions? Sure. What about the um the tech itself yeah uh yeah. when you say it's um there's nothing like it or it's unprecedented yeah um in, in terms of that which, which bits of the tech were like for example in terms of cogs yes yeah. mechanics of cogs what's going on around that time in that area and when and wh when are there comparable things later uh, and other bits of the tech, like what, what, what is completely weird and what is um, not so far away from the time? Um, well, it, 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 it's, it's a bit difficult to, to say with any degree of authority, but um, there, are, there's, there are cogs and there are cogs. So um, like ancient Egyptians are using like simple cogs for stuff like um, irrigation devices. So, you know, if you want to um, transfer the um, movement of a mule into the movement of a wheel that lifts a bucket, um, the ancient Egyptians could do that with um, sim simple wooden cogs. Um, but that is, of course, a world away from cogs whose movements are mathematically calculated to um, correspond to the movement of an astral body. Um, and uh, there are some sort of, there's some disagreement among scientists about how well the, the, the mechanism worked in, in this particular respect, because um, the, the cogs, while sort of precisely calculated for the time, they are, they are made of bronze and that was the material they had, but bronze is not a perfect item for making precision tools out of. It, it, it's soft and easy to damage. Um, so, uh, and, it, and it's a little bit hard to tell exactly from what's left, exactly how the cogs kind of um, interacted with each other. So um, some, people have tried to replicate the movements of the cogs with them having triangular teeth that mesh together. And some people have tried to um, recreate the movement of the cogs with kind of square teeth that mesh together. Uh, and it seems that, it's, it's again, a bit of a mystery. It seems like the movements of the cogs are more accurate with square teeth, but from the remains we have, it looks more likely that they were triangular. So anyway, I've, just chatted a load of stuff about cogs. But to actually answer your question, um, there's 
as far as I know, there's nobody else anywhere doing mathematically precise movements of cogs to represent an external reality. That is a huge conceptual leap unique to the device. And is there anything um, to suggest it was uh, connected to divination? Uh, I think um, there is actually. Um, and it, obviously here I, I get into very speculative territory, but um, we know that it was used to mark the, uh, because of some more inscriptions on the back, um, it was used to mark the dates for um, s significant sporting events, possibly the Olympics, but absolutely definitely um, for a major athletics tournament on the island of Rhodes, because that is specifically referred to in one of the inscriptions on the back. And uh, those, uh, the dates of those events were um, determined with reference to um, the movements of the moon. Um, but you would, um, you would ask, uh, we, we think they would ask, be sort of asking the computer the question in a kind of like consulting the oracle kind of a way, or when should the great important event happen? Um, and then the computer would kind of, I mean, this is speculative, you understand, but kind of almost mystically come up with the answer, which would actually just be a calculation. I see, cool, thank you. Why do you think um, modern scholars are playing down the, uh, the mystery of its creation at the moment? So, um, I, I think um, possibly because... Uh, Aliens? Uh, sorry? It's aliens. They don't want to go into the. <laughs> yes, they don't want to. They don't want to re reveal the the terrible alien truth um, behind the mechanism's creation. No, uh, un unfortunately, um, you know, whereas Derek J. De Sola Price with, the, with his funky glasses was absolutely unafraid of saying, "I don't know what the hell this thing is or how it can exist." Um, modern scholars have um, really quite a vested interest in um, saying everything can be explained because you're, you're not you're not going to get f funding for saying we don't know what the hell is going on with this you know um, and I, I, I think it's a shame because well I think we should uh, try and explain you know um, mysteries we should also admit when, when we can't because um, that's much more interesting uh, but uh, I, I think as well, the all of this sort of alien speculation and um, the Eric von Danigan chariot of the gods kind of thing that, that's gone with it. Um, I think academics, when they see that, they na they can't help it. They naturally push against it um, to the to the point of over-explaining and even sometimes overplaying their hand and and and, and saying that. You know, things are definite when they're when they're not necessarily because there are so many unknowns um, sur sur surrounding the mechanism. I, I, th I think it's a real shame when um, uh, when people kill the mystery like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they you know they they've got a job to do. Why why do you think that we don't see anything like the mechanism again for such a long period of time? I mean, that's um a, a super hard question uh, uh, uh and it's a really interesting one and uh i think it's um i i think it's because um of this sort of underlying sort of socio-economic conditions that you need to create really incredible scientific breakthroughs and i think you know, um, they just didn't exist um, elsewhere for a very long time because you need a lot. Of, you need a lot of things to align to start creating really breakthrough technology. Um, people aren't going to do that unless 
they can eat unless they're comfortable. Um, you know, pe people don't do abstract thought while they're worrying about how to feed themselves. So you need a real sort of concentration of prosperity. And you also need prosperity to sponsor all of these people um, to, to create these weird things that have absolutely no economic payback. You know, um, people spending possibly months, um, possibly even years, work, working on this stuff, and it will it will feed nobody. So um, you, uh -huh. you need a, a weird combination of prosperity and intellectual capital, and, and the space and stability for for it to happen. And the ancient world just isn't very stable, uh, and. Uh, I, I think you just had possibly a little sort of oasis in history, roads in which this could happen, and then the stars just didn't align anywhere else for a long time afterwards. But obviously that's just total speculation. Sorry, Daniel, were you saying something? Uh, no, sorry, my son just rocked up with an orange. I was talking to him, sorry. <laughs> All right, well, oranges are good. You think that it was a kind of working model or a prototype, and that perhaps they're just it wasn't one inventor's pet project? Because would it would it not have been commissioned by somebody if it was used to set dates for auspicious dates for events and things like that? Yeah, I mean, it's um, I think, um, I th I, again, this is sort of me, me taking a punt. I think the device that we have is almost certainly like the one that's the big deal. Um, I think there were probably prototypes or working models beforehand. Um, but uh, it's, it's more likely that they survive um, because they would be considered less important, less worthy of preservation than the real one that's the big deal um also the sort of the theory surrounding the shipwreck um make me think that this mechanism that we've got is, is the real one because um the theory goes that the ship that was carrying all of this treasure you know, the, these fantastic statues um works of art um coins pottery uh was a ship carrying um, Roman pillage because the Romans had been reconquering Greece uh, at around this time. And they'd seized a load of like, just whatever, I mean, the Romans were terrible pillagers. And they'd seized a whole load of whatever was valuable they could get their hands on. And, um, and the mechanism was just like somebody, some Roman magpie and going, yeah, that looks weird, I'll have that, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's likely um, that we have the finished model because that would be the valuable thing that the Romans wanted to steal. Mm -hmm. what, what has it been about the Antikythera mechanism that's intrigued you and inspired you to write a book about it? What has really kind of caught your imagination? So um, I like the mechanism on many different levels. I, um, I mean, on, there's, there's, the, there's the really sort of simple um, technological ingenuity that appeals to uh, the geek in me. But what I most like about it is um, its unknowability. The fact that I can sit here and have read a couple of books, maybe a dozen articles about it, still be absolutely unable to give you definite answers <laughs> about tons of things um it, it is um what makes it interesting um so it, it's right at the limits of um sort of it, it, it it's right at the limits of science it, it, it it's a gray area um and i like um you know whenever whenever i see a sort of a, a gray area my imagination um, just just wants to fill it um, and but but more than that you know it's also the fact that the mechanism is an impossible thing 
um, just makes me happy because like the real life can just be absolutely stultifyingly mundane. Um, you know, the, all, all, the, all the shit that we have to gr grind through every, every, every day. And um, when everything is just sort of explained and obvious and, and la laid out, it, it becomes more, real life becomes more mundane to the point of becoming depressing. But when I see something like the Antikythera mechanism, um, it just breaks all the rules. Um, it, its very existence says, you know what? You thought you could explain everything. You can't. The world's just really weird and I'm the evidence of it. Um, and that's, that's why I love it. That's why I love it. Because it just forces you to sort of like reinvent the world. Can you tell us a little bit about your book and where we might be able to get hold of it? Oh, you're asking an author to talk about his book. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a dangerous game. It's a dangerous game. Um, so, uh, yeah, my book, The Crime Machine, uh, it's, uh, it's on Amazon, it's on Waterstones. Um, obviously the best place you can buy it, buy it is from, uh, your local independent bookstore. They, they can get it in. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a heist story. Uh, it's, it's about a heist to steal, um, the mechanism from uh, a museum in a near future Jerusalem. Um, so, uh, and yeah, it's, it, it takes place in a world in which, um, Europe has kind of like gone mad and blown up and it's in flames and there are European refugees are fleeing to the Middle East. Um, and, uh, my protagonist, uh, Clementine is one of these European refugees and she has to make a new life in the new city with no money and no friends. Uh, and she falls into crime um, because she has no other options. Um, and as it turns out, she has, as Liam Neeson says, a very particular set of skills um, that makes her very well suited uh, to uh, st stealing stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a grand old heist to steal the mechanism from um, Jerusalem's great museum. Um, and, uh, but of course, like all the best heists, it goes badly wrong. Uh, and nobody involved is who they said they were. Uh, that's probably about all I can say without loads of spoilers. <laughs> that's great. I'll get hold. I'll get hold of that from my local bookstore when uh, when it reopens at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. indeed. What is the weirdest theory about the Antikythera mechanism that you've heard? Like, is it aliens, or is um, there anything else going on? The the, the thing is with um. I mean, I, I, I love a good uh, ancient, ancient alien theory, um, but uh, the, the, th the thing is, once people get going on them, they inevitably start sort of grabbing bits and pieces of, of, of myth and legend and putting them together in slightly ridiculous combinations. So because um, the Antikythera mechanism is part of um, the ancient Greek pack, pack, the ancient Greek package of weird stuff. Um, invariably, it gets bundled in with Atlantis. Um, so, uh, oh, that the, um, that does sound reasonable, though. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it becomes evidence that um, ancient Atlanteans were, you know, make, make, making the, the advanced tech. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that would be uh, easier. I mean, it, that would be easier to buy into if um, everything else around it wasn't just so obviously from an actual place that we actually know. Is there, are any, um, is any work going on now over the same site? Is any, is there any chance that any new thing might be discovered that may reveal more of, um, its origins? Yeah. I mean, um, I think the last dive was two years ago now. Uh, and they're always saying, oh yeah, we're going to find some more fragments 
of, of the mechanism and you know the, the the essential missing piece of the puzzle that will make everything clear is always just out of reach uh, and i um you know i hopefully um that'll change hopefully somebody will one one day will go down and dig in the sand and come up with you know a great chunk of something you know the cog that fits with the other cogs and it'll all become clear um there's no one creating the working model of it to date then it's not well, possible to do that well um i mean that that picture i showed uh, earlier uh it sort of moves um but that's not it. that's not a working model um the the working models um there's th i think the one that um derek j was pictured with in the picture of him um that that's like one of the first working models but it's um they're they're really inaccurate um they move at highly variable speeds depending on what the cogs are doing so they have models that sort of work but we don't think they work as it was intended to function they're just you know um out by days or even weeks sometimes that's great has anyone else got any other questions at all uh, ba -ba. no i don't think so all right <laughs> well, thank you so much well, thank for giving us, Greg. Well, that's a pleasure, Sarah. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it was great to. Um, I didn't know quite a few of those things about the Antikythera me mechanism. I remember getting really into it in an ancient aliens type way uh, a while ago, and then um, when I saw that you'd written that book, I kind of it reignited my interest. But I didn't realise. I I did remember that bit actually about it being used to um, to plan dates for to match celestial events and things like that. It's, it's really interesting. It seems like there probably will be something in the future where we'll have a bit of a better idea about who did commission it or what it was used for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, certainly the, with, with, with the Rhodes Connection, you can, you can start to ask s specific questions about whether, whether specific people were, were involved so it, so you can really start to narrow down possibilities so you can That's say you know, it, more or less agreed upon origin of it then now no no oh, that really? i mean that's just that that's that's my assessment okay. of uh the evidence that's out there um and i mean you know uh it's it's a respectable assessment but um you know you you are you ask four different scientists and they'll pick holes in it four different ways you know um there's absolutely you know there's no guarantees is there is there anyone is there any kind of uh any theory that a few scholars agree on in terms of origins or or not even that far yet um well i mean people were jumping I, th I think about four five years ago people were jumping on the archimedes one okay. pretty 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 heftily um which is sort of one of the reasons they picked up on it but also just because archimedes is, is interesting you know um but uh i'm just trying to try to think of um in in any of the ones i haven't touched on i mean there's 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 somebody i think was thinking about an alexandrine collect, collection there's also um because uh some of the um mathematical calculations um that you have have to make um to make the device work um apparently and i'm not enough of a mathematician to actually give you chapter and verse on this uh apparently um they were sort of indecipherable if you just used the mathematics that we knew the ancient Greeks used um, but if you used ancient Babylonian mathematic mathematical techniques um, things suddenly started making sense so um, so it may have been something to do with Alexandria because you had such a melting pot of different cultures coming together in that was Rome I mean, exclusively <laughs> at that time um yeah i mean the, certainly the, the the ideas the 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 um 
the ideas from ancient Babylon um, were exported widely. They would have found their way to Alexandria and, 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 and into, into the Greek world. Um, but, you know... Maybe that's why we uh, don't have any evidence of it, because of the, the burning down of the library at Alexandria. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, well, date, date. Yeah, no, maybe, maybe, yeah. We nailed it. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> On that note, that was great. All right. <laughs> Let, well, let's uh, reconvene when we've got more information on this. I'll start looking up Wikipedia now. <laughs> and you can tell me all the ways in which I am wrong. Yeah, all right then. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And um, I'll right. be on YouTube so people that weren't able to join us live can have a look at it as well. But thanks, great. Again, thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye. Really all right. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks very much.